As I record this, it's December 18th, 2020, and that's the 10th anniversary of the Arab Spring. What I want to do in a series of two videos, of which this is the first, is to look at the Arab Spring and why it failed to live up to its promise. And then in the second video, look at what the implications of that are for the West in general and the United States in particular. Not with regard to foreign policy or wars or terrorism, but the internal politics that we're witnessing developing in the West and especially in the United States. So there's going to be two videos. This is the first one on the Arab Spring itself and why it failed. Most people see an event that happened in Tunisia in, uh, 10 years ago on this date, December 18th, when a man set himself on fire as a form of protest. What happened over the ensuing months were a series of events around the Arab world that we started to call, even at the time, the Arab Spring. That spring I was teaching my graduate course on the United States and the Middle East. And what I thought I'd do is to invite another voice into the course, a colleague who was of Egyptian ethnicity, born in the US, and a Muslim, and have her come in and present to the class her take on what was going on during you know, the Arab Spring. And she gave her views on what was happening, which were relatively positive. I didn't agree with almost everything she was saying, but she's a guest in my class. I wasn't interrupting her. I didn't say a word. I just listened. And then when she had finished, the students started asking her questions. At one point, one of the students asked what I thought, because I was sitting up there next to her as you know, where she was standing at the podium. And I said, I, you know, I'm sorry, but <laughs> I disagree. I didn't go into a lot of detail because I didn't want to derail the conversation and take the spotlight from her. But I said, you know, m my experience studying the Middle East is that if something can go wrong, it will. So basically, my guess is the Arab Spring's going to fizzle out. You know, we'll be lucky if it doesn't make things worse or something like that. And of course, that's what happened. But that's not what I want to talk about in this first video of a series of two. What I do want to talk about is why it didn't pan out. Why didn't it play out? Why didn't the Arab Spring live up to its promises? And the answer isn't that complex, but it's complex enough that I think the problem is most people in the West don't understand it. The goal in the Arab Spring in many ways was to bring, you know, secularism to the Islamic world, at least to the Arab Islamic world. You know, you can go from, uh, you know, basically a religious focused society to a secular society, you know, like that. Like that was going to happen in one season, in one spring. And, and the problem I had with what my colleague was saying wasn't that she didn't understand the Arab world or the Middle East or the Islamic world in general. I think her, her understanding of all that was better than mine. The problem was, from my point of view, is she didn't understand the development of the West and how the West became the kind of secular society that she was hoping to see in the Arab world. Because the reality is, it didn't just happen like that. It's like one day, a bunch of people sat around and say, hey, let's go secular. You know, let's go, go non-theocratic. Let's just do it. And then it happened. The West moved from a sort of theocratic centered belief structure, you know, coming out of the Middle Ages, a feudal a feudalism dominated by the Catholic Church, to what we consider a, a modern, modernish at least secular society. It took centuries. It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen in a decade. It didn't happen in a century. You could say it begins with the Renaissance, you know, somewhere 
13th, 14th century, somewhere around there. And it continues right into the 18th century before it's complete. This took hundreds and hundreds of years. And if you don't understand that, then you can't understand why the Islamic world just doesn't become secular. Like, boom, it can't possibly happen. Using the experiences of the West, they could do it more quickly, I believe, but they're not going to do it overnight. They're not going to do it in a season. They're not going to do it in an Arab spring. And that's why they failed. What people don't understand about the development of a secular society, that's a non-theocratic society, secular just meaning, you know, it's not dominated by religion, not just in a political sense, but in an intellectual sense, that that process developed in the West over a long series of time. And before you ended up with a secular state, you had to secularize the individual disciplines that fed into that. In other words, the building blocks of a secular state are secular disciplines. In many ways, I don't want to bring up Jill Biden, but this gets into the whole idea of what a doctorate is. And why, you know, for example, I have a PhD in history, but my degree says doctor of philosophy. If I was a physicist, it would say doctor of philosophy. If I was a philosopher, it would say doctor of philosophy. If it was in literature, it would be doctor of philosophy. Mathematics, doctor of philosophy. Why are they all called doctors of philosophy? And why aren't other doctorates called doctors of philosophy? Why are they doctors of education, doctors of medicine, doctors, doctors of dental surgery, uh, doctors of law? And this all gets back to the development of a secular society. Because as I said, before secular society could develop, the disciplines had to secularize themselves. And this happened over a period of centuries. What you have to understand is coming out in the Middle Ages, basically a, a, a theo, God-centered society, all the disciplines were the same way. You know, if, if you were a scientist, the science was what was in the Bible. You know, the earth is flat. It's a, a geocentric system we're in. Earth is at the center. The sun and the planets all revolve around the earth. That's what it says in the Bible. The sky is, you know, a filament, sort of like a, a dome. That's science. Everything that happens in science has to conform with the Bible, all the New Testament. It's the same in, in philosophy. What's philosophy? Philosophy is Christian philosophy. What's politics? You know, what would Jesus do? What did King David do? What did King Solomon do? And notice they're all kings. So what you're looking at is monarchy. Uh, economics. What's, you know, why do you have no usury? Well, because, you know, it's, it's bad and you know, Christ kicked over the tables at the temple, yada, yada, yada. History. What's history? History is, you know, the story of man leading up to the birth of Christ the story of Christ, and then subsequent history is just we're waiting for the second coming and the ending of the world and the end of times. That's history. That's the philosophy of history. And that's basically true of all the disciplines. Everything has to be in conformity with Christianity, not just because they're politically dominant, but because they're intellectually dominant. And it took centuries for these disciplines to break free. I guess the one that most people are familiar with is the story of Galileo. I mean, Galileo, 16th century, came to believe from his observations, his scientific approach, that we lived in a heliocentric system, that the sun is at the center and the earth revolves around the sun. That did not conform with the Bible. And that's why ultimately he couldn't continue to push that view. And he, under threat of torture, I mean, they brought this old man into this room and they laid out the instruments of torture in front of him and made it quite clear what was going to happen if he didn't recant. And he did. And then later on, Copernicus 
published his book, but, but he didn't publish it until he was dead. He had his friends publish it after he was dead when they couldn't torture him or do anything to him. That's what I'm talking about here, that before you can have a secular society, you have to have secular science. You have to break science free. You need an inherent philosophy of science that's separate from the philosophy and the approaches that you see in the Old and New Christian Testaments. The same thing happens in the other disciplines, philosophy, Descartes, uh, history, a bell. You know, history isn't about just get, you know, getting us to the second coming. History is just history. It's the history of us, the history of human beings. And, and that's what Bell changes the approach of uh, historical study and, and gives us the infamous footnote. <laughs> I mean, back, he's, he's the, basically the uh, uh, first one to use footnotes in, in some of the stuff he writes. Uh, economics, politics, Machiavelli. You know, what was political philosophy before Machiavelli? Solomon, David, the other kings of, uh, of Israel, the New Testament. What would Jesus do? But Machiavelli looks at politics, and he's not talking about those things. He said, what's the optimum thing for, for example, a prince to do? How should he operate? Not with reference to the Bible, but with reference to common sense. What Machiavelli wasn't doing was just giving us the prints and giving us this blueprint for Machiavelliism. He was breaking political science free from the control of theocracy. And it's by getting all these disciplines to open up, to split away from theocratic control, to develop their own internal philosophies for each of the disciplines, that provides the building blocks ultimately for an entirely secular society. And it's why the people in those disciplines, like me, have a degree called Doctor of Philosophy, not Doctor of History. And all the disciplines in the, the modern liberal arts share that distinction. We're all Doctors of Philosophy because we are using a new philosophy, novel, in historic terms, that broke free from theocratic outlines, theocratic control. That's what developed secularism in the West, that these disciplines, secular disciplines, were the foundation for ultimately a secular society and a secular state. If you understand that, and most people don't, then you you know, you understand why you can't replicate this in the Arab world in a single spring. The Arab world can never become secular, or the Islamic world in general, until the disciplines are able to free themselves from the control of theocracy. And you hear about this stuff all the time. When you look, you hear people talking about Islamic economics, Islamic science, Islamic politics. Right away, what they're telling you is, we ain't broken free yet. The disciplines in Islam aren't secular. They all have to somehow conform with the, what, oh, what does the Quran say? And you can see Muslims are always trying to figure out, oh, well, this scientific thing you can find, you know, in this sort of vague generality driven part of the Quran. And, oh, that, that's what that's what Muhammad was talking about. It's science. You know, everything's got to be grounded in in the, the Quran, the Hadith, and the other holy books. That's the situation the West was in before the disciplines broke free. And until the disciplines in Islam break free and are allowed to break free, remember this was a struggle. You know, they threatened to kill Galileo. Other people were killed. Until they can break the disciplines free in the Islamic world, they're not going to ever get to a secular society. So to me, when the Arab Spring broke out, I said, no way, it's not going to work. You can't do it from the top down. It started from the bottom up in the West if you want to replicate it. I said, you can speed it up by following examples from the West, but you're not going to do it in a season. You're not going to do it in a year. It's going to take decades at least, if not the centuries it took in the West. And that's why 
the Arab Spring failed. That's why it didn't live up to its promises. It couldn't because the assumptions people brought to it were unfounded. Because not because they didn't understand the Islamic world, like my colleague, she does. She much better understanding than me. But they don't understand how the West got where it was. If you like this video, get ready to watch the second one. I'm going to try to post them together, I hope. So you can, if you're interested, you can just pop into the second one. Uh, in the interim, give it a thumbs up. Hit the notification button so you know when I post new videos. Share the video with your friends. Subscribe to the channel. And until the next time, keep fighting.